I don't know. Say it with me. I don't know. Good God, it is liberating. I am a towering mountain of ignorance. I don't know. We're taught to believe that everything has a reason. Now, I'm glad that we have the desire to understand the world. That results in all sorts of great stuff. We want to know everything. We're humans. We're curious. And maybe it's our culture. Maybe it's just humanity. But I think a lot of the time we end up mixing up thinking something with knowing something. Suddenly, I know that I don't know. But somehow, everyone else seems to know. They all know differently from each other, but they all seem to know. What I'm saying is nobody's opinions are correct in the world. And yet, it's impossible not to tie your opinions to your concept of self. And often, people tie those things so closely together that they begin defending their guesses as if they're defending their very lives. In a way, they are. This is why it can be so impossible to talk about certain topics with certain people. They've tied those suppositions to themselves so tightly with knots of narrative and constructed reality and values that there's just no untying it. And maybe, unsurprisingly, in those situations, the best course of action is just to be friends. The world as we perceive it, as we've built it inside of ourselves, is a lie that we tell to ourselves, not out of deception, but out of necessity. We simply cannot understand the world as it is, and so we construct. But sometimes I just have to tell myself the thing that is definitely true, the truest thing I can say, which is that I don't know. This is the Everyone's Agnostic Podcast with Bob Pondillo and Cass Midgley. One thing that leaving religion has done for me is it has made me a much less cruel person. <laughs> because... Religion not only played to the worst parts of my nature yeah. and encouraged me to judge and to other, but it, it morally obligated me to do shitty things that I wouldn't have necessarily done. Welcome, everyone, to episode 183 of the Everyone's Agnostic Podcast. I'm Cass Midgley. Today, Bob Pondillo and I interview Keith B., Keith is a software engineer, dancer, and ex-creationist living in Augusta, Georgia. He came from a homeschooling independent fundamental Baptist family in Southern California, got a degree in biology at Pensacola Christian College, and moved to Georgia to start a secular Ph.D. program in biology. While in grad school, Keith started dancing. His world expanded as he became close friends with people outside the fundamentalist world. And eventually, religion could no longer withstand the strain of contradictions these new connections were revealing. He'd begun reading about the history of Christianity, and initially, the evidence he learned only made him question fundamentalism. As he attempted to find a faith he could hold in good conscience, he was surprised to discover that in his commitment to evidence, he'd become an atheist. He's now an atheist and secular humanist and tries to follow the evidence and live a life of sight, not faith. This talk went long because after an hour of taping, Bob had to leave, and yet Keith had more points he wanted to cover, so he and I kept talking for another 45 minutes. We talk about mitochondria, polyamory, and his deconversion process. He's a fascinating person and thinker. I think you're going to enjoy this conversation. We taped it on December 16th, 2017. <laughs> We interview people you don't know about a subject no one wants to talk about. We hope to encourage people in the process of deconstructing their faith and help curb the loneliness that accompanies it. We think the world is a better place when more people live by sight, not by faith. Please subscribe to our podcast and leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, you can support us monetarily in two easy ways. You can pledge $1 per episode or more through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash EA podcast. Or leave a lump sum donation through PayPal at our website, everyonesagnostic.com. The smallest contribution is greatly appreciated. Our opening monologue is an excerpt from a YouTube by Hank Green titled Towering Mountain of Ignorance. The music behind it is Never Know by Jack Johnson. 
The Segway music on this episode was created by yours truly. Thanks for listening, and be a yes-sayer to what is. Hello, hello. Hey, Hey, Keith. Hey, Bob, how are you doing? I'm over here. Well, I'm fine. How are you? I'm doing really well. Good. So you're down in Georgia. Yes, though at the moment... I'm in Greenville, South Carolina. I am. I was up here for a dance last night, so I'm doing this interview from a friend's house. Okay. But I live in Augusta, Georgia. So you travel and dance? Obsessively. No kidding. What kind of dancing do you do? I do swing, blues, and tango. Really? Mm -hmm. (laughs) How awesome is that? What were you doing last night then? So last night I was doing uh, swing and blues dancing. Wow. So, so you do it, you you do it. I mean, you do some really. Uh, you're the real deal. Complicated, yeah. <laughs> right. It's not. Just I don't know. It's I don't do really the sort of performance style. It's all social dancing. But yeah, it's it's completely improv partner dancing. You can dance it with someone that you've never met before and have a great dance anyway. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe you can. What but... about an untrained partner? You can kind of lead them. <laughs> the better you are, the less experience your partner needs yeah for so sure. oh, okay huh. so yeah i've i've been doing this for a while and i definitely i mean i danced with some people last night who it was like their third time dancing ever and we had awesome dances so wow that's yeah. outstanding very good how long you been doing it so i started dancing in 2005 with tango okay and then i started swing dancing right at the end of 2009 okay wow right. and Blues dancing is kind of in that same community, the swing dance community. Yeah. Hmm. All right, man. Well, let's let's get into your story. Uh, What's your religious up upbringing, and uh, you know the context of your childhood faith? I was raised in the IFB, the Independent Fundamental Baptist Movement. Yeah, when we had uh, L on, right, just Mm -hmm. a couple episodes back. Okay. Yeah, Yeah, IFB. So, how was your? What was your experience? So we were. Not as fundamentalist when I was younger as we kind of became once I got in middle school. Mm -hmm. Like the pastor of the church I grew up in when I was growing up, he was an old earth creationist. I think you might be familiar with the quote, uh, the the gap theory. What is the Uh, gap theory just for? God of the gaps or? Is that what you mean? the, The gap theory is the idea that you can reconcile Genesis with scientific observation about the age of the earth by positing a gap of millions of years between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. Oh, okay. Well, and so I think what when he says old earth creationist, he's Mm -hmm. acknowledging that the earth is billions of years old, right? Correct. Yeah. Oh, okay. But it's still, but he's still, he's saying it's consistent with Genesis 1 and 2. Gotcha. Yes. Now, my family we were still young earth creationists um, and they, that was kind of a little bit of a sticking point, but I was not necessarily as enmeshed in sort of the crazy side of fundamentalism early on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you mention where this was? Was this Georgia? No, this was Southern California, believe it or not. Okay. There's, there's, there's little enclaves everywhere. Yeah. He's your, the pastor at the time was probably more intellectual, more progressive than your parents were. Yes. And then I'm I take it that you either moved churches or he left and somebody else came in and what he happened? He left and the new pastor came in. Yeah. Mm. And this new pastor was the sort of fundamentalist that is proud of the fact that they never went to Bible college, mm-hmm. things like that. I've actually found out recently that church has actually gone all the way to quote geocentricity. The that earth is the center of the universe? That, yes, that the sun goes around the earth. No way. Oh. That's now being preached in the church I grew up in. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> wow. How, really? How backwards can we get? Right? Um, don't ask that question because they will answer you and get more backwards, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, so I just want to touch on this pride thing about, you know, the disciples were just fishermen and, you know, just, yes. just you know, and if it's good enough for them, you know, Jesus... And the wisdom of the world is is foolishness to God. And so, actually, the more, I hate to say it, but uneducated or stupid you are, the more useful you are to God. Mm-hmm. I love the uneducated. Trump. Well, well the, the, so do <laughs> yeah. dictators. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, yeah. uh, but, you know, you're, you want to be an empty vessel. So if your brain is empty, then God can fill it. Because, like, even words of knowledge, I don't know. I guess independent fundamental Baptists, did they believe in, like, prophecy and speaking in tongues, or were they more just... No. Bi- no, okay. They, yeah. We no. were very anti that. Anti-gift. You know, yes. Spiritual oh. gifts. Okay. So mm-hmm. it was was it more like Church of Christ kind of stuff, yeah. where it's a lot more intellectual, a lot more uh, Bible biblical, based. Yeah. biblical based. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So your middle school, your family is getting more and more fundamentalist. <clears throat> the, the church is getting more fundamentalist. Mm-hmm. What's going on in your mind? I'm buying into it entirely. I was very committed to it, to the extent that. When I went to college, I didn't even consider secular colleges. I ended up going to Pensacola Christian College, mm-hmm. which is a fundamental Baptist university in Florida. Okay. Mm-hmm. I majored in biology what? as a young earth creationist at a young <laughs> earth creationist college. Okay. So it's, where is that? Pensacola, you say? Yeah. Yep. In Florida. So how do they teach biology in a evangelical yeah. in a, in a, <laughs> College. So the thing is, and probably a little later when we talk about grad school, I will kind of get into this because evolution is really a very synthetic topic, meaning that the necessity for it to explain things doesn't really occur until you start looking at the big picture altogether. Mm-hmm. You don't need to even touch on evolution to learn most of undergrad biology, oh. you know, especially like – anatomy and physiology you're just learning sort of bare facts and when you're learning about individual systems you're learning about ecosystems which of course fundamentalists are also very anti-environmentalist so (laughs) we didn't even have like a full class in ecology it was kind of touched on as okay ecosystems are a thing but caring about them is liberal nonsense Mm -hmm. um well because god's God's taking care of that oh yeah because god god's taking care of it the It's kind of a weird sort of reverse audacity that there's nothing possible that we could do to destroy the ecosystem because God. Yeah. (laughs) So why worry about it? Or or make it better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or make it better. Okay. So are you? Were you the type that, you know, if you if you believe, and this is kind of a pre-existing bias, you know, but if you believe that Mm -hmm. there's a God who made all this, your pursuit of science or pulling back the veneer and understanding, you know, how the eyeball works or how, you know, cutting up on a frog or whatever, <laughs> that you're, you're not afraid because you're just going to be f- discovering more and in more detail of what God has already done. Hmm. Correct. And that was definitely my approach. Okay. Yeah, you're not afraid of science because it's God's behind the curtain. Okay. Mm-hmm. And right. one thing... Is of course, like starting in high school, really, I got a lot of the the creationism apologetics, you know, Ken Ham, Kent Hovind, people like that. Mm-hmm. I bought that. But one thing that – the one reason like science communication is very important to me now, because those apologetics work. The reason they work is the secular world – the educational system doesn't teach evolution in a really very sensible manner. So a lot of those apologetic critiques of evolution are perfectly valid critiques of the just really wrong ways evolution is presented in the education system. Uh So now I had this list of responses if evolutionists say this, that, and the other. And then the actual evolutionists I would talk to would say exactly those things. And I knew the logical responses to them Hmm. because I was being taught a caricature of evolution, but that same caricature of evolution, possibly in the name of simplifying things to make it easier for, say, high school students to understand, et cetera, Hmm. that was very, very close to what was actually what was actually being taught to people. If someone believed in evolution, this caricature of evolution is probably very close to what they were being taught. Okay. And so I really wasn't m- meaningfully challenged in interacting with people, with my peers that believed in evolution or anything like that. So did gotcha. you aspire to be an apologist for, for science and for creationism? No. Um, 
I, I believed it was true, but I really just wanted to do science. Yeah, but you did uh, you mm-hmm. did take on the teachings of Hovine and, and Ham in that you had a response. So you kind of liked having those responses in your knapsack. Yes. Yeah. But I yes, and and I but it was more in the be ready always to give an answer to every man. There you go. Kind of verse. Yeah. Okay. So you yeah, go to uh, so you're uh, let's see. At what point in college, I guess you're just you're just doing your undergrad. Your faith is still intact, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. So when does it begin to crumble? So then I then I go to grad school because Pensacola Christian was not accredited at the time, so my grad school options were very limited. But that that's why I still live in Augusta, Georgia. I went to school there, and I just kind of stayed out of inertia because it's not a bad place to live, yeah. and. I hate moving. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, which college is in Augusta? So, I went to Medical College of Georgia, which is now part of Augusta University. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, are you currently in in the PhD program? No. So, for completely other reasons, I ended up switching careers, and now I'm a software engineer. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> I ended up leaving the field. Gotcha. But, so, I went to grad school, still very committed young Earth creationist fundamentalist Christian. I went there in 2005, was there through 2009. 2005 is also when I started dancing, which will definitely play into the deconversion in a lot of ways. <laughs> but all the way through grad school, my faith wasn't really meaningfully challenged. I never really experienced cognitive dissonance. So I, when I left grad school, started working, I had been dancing now at that point for about four years. So I was mostly dancing in town with the Augusta Tango Club, and then I'd carpool with some of the other dancers to events a couple hours away, maybe. Did you ever dance before? And then no, s- I had. So you just suddenly it clicked, and you, and you started. Mm-hmm. How did that? So t- when I moved to Augusta, I got a copy of the local alternative newspaper. You know that most cities have. You yeah. Know, and art and culture. It just because I wanted yeah. to find out. Yeah, where. You know, I did theater and I did choir from undergrad and I wanted to get involved in arts groups locally. So I got that to find out when the rehearsals and auditions and things like that were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there was a little ad in the events, Friday nights, free tango lessons. Mm -hmm. And so I got, I was intrigued. I cut that out and I put it on my refrigerator for probably a month or so. It was sitting there. And then one Friday night I was like, I'm bored, and I suppose I could be around people right now. Yeah. So, so are you single at this time? I mean, at, yes. at the time you're looking at these ads? Yes. Okay, so you're looking I, for yeah. community and, you know, friends and what have Something to yeah. do. Yeah. Exactly. So how'd that first lesson and go? So, great. I got hooked. Yeah, basically, I have... Never looked back. S- yeah, since then, there have been very few periods of my life that I have not been dancing at least once a week somewhere. Wow. Hmm. It's probably good exercise too. Oh, oh it is. Okay. So, I, I don't, did we ever get to how you, you know, when when your face started falling apart? So that that's actually where the dancing thing is leading. Okay, okay. go for it. So of course, Baptists don't dance. <laughs> the joke that you may have heard: mm-hmm. Why don't Baptists have sex standing up? Because it leads to dancing. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yes, we'll have none of that. Mm. Right? Okay. Yeah. So one benefit to sort of my early bringing up in fundamentalism, which was much more intellectual, is it was not the sort of fundamentalism where people just blindly accept things. Instead, it was sort of a hyper-rationalism yeah. where you accept a few absurd premises like verbal plenary inspiration of the Bible – Wait, um, and, want to unpack that one? <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, I jargon. Yeah, there's so, me. Verbal, right. verbal, the, plen- the verbal, pl- verbal plenary inspiration means the so the verbal means every single word of the Bible was specifically inspired, not just ideas. And then plenary means every single word. So that the the doctrine of verbal plenary inspiration is that. Every single word in the Bible was actually specifically selected by God. Mm-hmm. In, in the original 
language in thing. in in the original. Yeah, and um, there there are positions. It's in the in the IFB movement actually, because most IFBs use the King James, mm-hmm. and one way of dealing with the fact that it's just easily observable that the King James disagrees with some of what we actually have of of what we think the original text could have been. There is a doctrine that some people follow that we fortunately did not of re-inspiration that now the King James got re-inspired and now that's the perfect word of God. Yeah, I know. I know of churches that are like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. a benefit of that was when I did see some position that I didn't think lined up with those, mm-hmm. like not dancing. My mom still like cries about the fact that I dance. Mm. By the way, <laughs> like this is this is still a, a a major sticking point. Does she know you're not a believer? No, I am. I'm not out to them about that at this point. But um, she's upset about dancing. She's upset about the dancing. She has been for years. She used to print off sermons from like the 1920s and 30s and snail mail them to me. Sermons <laughs> against dancing. And what? And what's the main argument? Yeah. What's What's the problem with dancing? In the end, the argument is that all dancing is inherently sexual. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sure. And therefore, ship in all of the conservative sexual hangups yeah, the, and just apply them to dance. Yeah, you can't. She she might argue that you can't dance and not lust. Yeah, because yep. you're close to another person, that kind of stuff. Yeah, and they're wiggling. It's, and they're wiggling around. <laughs> which I I would love to see her response to knowing that I'm very confident that i'm perfectly straight and i dance with other men a lot too yeah of course she'd probably just view that as evidence that i'm gay so Mm -hmm. (laughs) you're perverted in many ways and you don't even know it it's the best way to be (laughs) so you're rigid uh like that you're raised with this devotion to every word and and Mm -hmm. so they you know they had their own way of being um scrupulous or you know mm-hmm. investigating and making sure they were on the right path and so that is in your dna now and you you know you go dancing you know yeah. that the church you're coming from says that dancing is evil and yet you're investing i can't find any way yeah you can't find any Bible. scriptures to proof text mm-hmm. that so you're exactly. sa- so these very skills that you got from them are the ones that are you know <laughs> kind of helping you say no I I think God loves dancing mm-hmm. or whatever <laughs> exactly <laughs> but then so in an interesting way even though dancing was not let's say my downfall in the way that the church people thought it would be it was in another way it was the catalyst for really my entire deconversion and that was opening myself up to acquaintances, friendships with people outside of my bubble. Okay. Yeah. And especially once I left grad school, got into swing dancing as well and started traveling a whole lot more because now I had a job that paid actual money and I had actual vacation days. I started traveling a lot for dancing. The size of my circle of acquaintance just grew. Mm -hmm. And so I was exposed to all of these people who thought in all of these different ways. They were nice people. They were not these demon liberals that I had been mm-hmm. raised to believe that they were. They did not have necessarily the character traits that I was taught to associate with the ideas that they held. Yeah. Gee, what character traits are they supposed to have? Well, um, you definitely start believing that, say, if someone – supports abortion that they obviously have no compassion and empathy oh all of the ideas surrounding Mm. can we be good without god yeah for sure okay yeah i get you and these were people that were Mm. quite frankly much better humans than a lot of the people i knew in the church and yet they didn't hold any of the ideas that i was taught were part and parcel with being Mm. just a kind empathetic loving person yeah i found a lot more love outside than inside the church yeah so the the premise of the scriptures or at least especially in this case is that humans are depraved 
Yes. And then God saves you from your depravity, gives you a new nature, a new spirit. You're, you're a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. You've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And now mm-hmm. you're good. And so, you know, Keith, you're talking about your whole circle of of friends and, and acquaintances was kind of in the bubble of the church. You get outside that bubble and... You know, and I think at these dance things, I mean, are are these the kind of things where you get a hotel and stay, or? Each sort of dance genre community has its own conventions, Mm -hmm. its own sort of social mores and expectations. The swing and blues dance community, you don't get a hotel because local dancers in whatever scene that you are going to travel to have signed up with the organizers of the event to host total strangers in their house. How about that? You just stay with dancers and... Yeah. And everyone opens their home to you. The reason I ask is it's like, okay, you're on the dance floor. You're dancing to a song. You don't have time to unpack their beliefs or their <laughs> worldviews, you know. So I was kind of wondering what context is, you know, this the, your your circle of friends expanded. And, mm-hmm. I, and it's off the dance floor that you get to meet yes. these people. And you see that they're good people. And, and uh, mm-hmm. you know, that is a big deal for, for – it was for me. Uh, I'm sitting across from the guy who stretched me the most, you know, because I mm-hmm. I, met, I had one foot in Christianity, and I went and I visited a Unitarian Universalist church, and I met Bob, and, and uh, then we started hanging out, and I could <laughs> not, it just was a cognitive dissonance for me, was that you were one of the sweetest guys I'd ever met, and yet you were pretty much a lifelong atheist, and, yeah. Yeah. I, and uh, how is that possible? I mean, there really is, it's, it's weird, I know, but... Huh. My mom, has, I know, has – I sort of in retrospect seeing her struggle with that in ways – we had a neighbor, this couple, Steve and Virginia, and my mom would constantly say – because he, he was a confirmed atheist. and Out and proud. Yeah, very much. And my mom would constantly say, if anyone could get into heaven for just being good, it would be Steve and Virginia. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the way you – you explain it away, and yet looking back at it, like how horrifying to to know that you're able to say, "Well, they're such a nice person. It's a pity that they're going to burn forever." <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's a cognitive dissonance. Yeah, yeah right. I suppose so, yeah. So, wow. as a kid, did you like believe in in a literal hell? Oh yes, we were definitely taught in literal of a literal hell, and. Any idea that sort of challenged that was liberal nonsense. Mm-hmm. Wow. Th- that fuck you up at all? <laughs> <laughs> Less so than a lot of people I've talked to. Hmm. I, quote, got saved very, very young, three years old, actually, like three and a half. Yeah. And I had in Sunday school been very scared because they were teaching these little three year olds about hell. Yeah. And. But then since we also, our, our sort of side of IFB was once saved, always saved. Yeah. Um, once I had that to hold on to, like, for most of my life, it was like, it was never really a threat to me because I could look back and say, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm cool. I got my fire insurance back then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but it, I think we can say that as you met people on the road dancing, it was mm-hmm. gonna, you could no longer just take comfort in the fact that you you had fire insurance. Yeah, you, because these, these now beautiful I'm people. These people. Yeah, these these beautiful loving people who cuz before, you know, when when you just demonize the other. Yeah. Then it's really hard to care that much about whether they're going to hell like evangelicals are uh, of any stripe and ifb is you know on the very far right of evangelical but evangelicals of any stripe are very fond of saying that they proselytize because they care about people Mm -hmm. and yet the actual idea of these people that they're evangelizing going to hell doesn't really bother them in the visceral way that it It ought to yeah right because they have so othered these people yep there you go. And that's my point. That's my point whenever you – you don't even know it. Because actually, now that we're talking about good people without God, mm-hmm. I think your mom and your and most Christians are good people without God, and, and that they have to compartmentalize that in order to remain good mm-hmm. people. And it's hard on yeah. the – it's hard on the human heart. It's hard on the brain. Because you go as a Christian, you go to Walmart, mm-hmm. and you're standing in line next to somebody or whatever. I don't know. I mean, just bumping into the world – 
Mm-hmm. And if you, in your mind, I've said this many times, know that they're going to be tortured forever in eternal torment, and you don't say, you know, as Pendulet says, how bad do you have to hate somebody? <laughs> to, not, yeah, which... to not grab them by the shoulders and shake them and say, you need to get right with Jesus. Right now you could die in the parking lot. Mm-hmm. I was still a fundamentalist when that vlog entry of his came out. Yeah. I remember that very distinctly. <laughs> yeah, and actually if you're did it did it make you want to double down on your evangelistic efforts? I was very involved in evangelism in my church. So it definitely sort of reconfirmed yes, this is why I do this thing. Mm-hmm. Um because I taught Awana and which is a yeah, children's about program. This yeah. children's program, and I ran a, a bus route, picked kids up from from various areas around town, and brought them to Sunday school on Sunday mornings. You know, and did door to door visitation on Saturdays. I was very involved in evangelism already, mm-hmm. but it definitely confirmed for me why I do that. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, and definitely made me question a lot of the people that did just kind of spin their wheels in church and. When I was in California, of course, Baptists, evangelicals, conservatives are kind of an embattled minority. And conservatives love being the underdog. Right. And mm-hmm. which is why everyone complains about the war on Christmas every time Starbucks makes a new cup. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and once I was out here, suddenly Christians are not the embattled minority. But I did see that most churches tend to be kind of social clubs and people aren't really sincere about them in the way that I thought they ought to be. Now, of course, I'm really glad at how, how little people take their doctrine seriously because the looser people hold their faith, the better for all of us. Yep, for yeah. sure. Including, yeah. including them, including the people in their lives. Because one thing that leaving religion has done for me is it has made me a much less cruel person. <laughs> because religion not only played to the worst parts of my nature yeah. and encouraged me to judge and to other, but it it morally obligated me to do shitty things that I wouldn't have necessarily done. Yeah. Hmm. So the looser people hold their religion, the better. Right. Huh. What shitty things would you have done? <laughs> well, well tell my gay friends that Hmm. I don't hate them, but I hate what they're doing. Yeah. (laughs) Things like that. Gotcha. Gotcha. You feel this moral obligation to be shitty to people quote out of love. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You can't be in a friendship with say a gay person and not, if you're silent, then in in your evangelical mind, Mm -hmm. then you're complicit. Right. Yeah. You're, how are you? Which helping? I mean, as Pe- as Penn Jillette said, if you follow that logic, how much literally would you have to hate them to not say something? Yeah. Yeah. yeah good if, point. If, you, if you follow that logic through, which is why it's such a damaging logic. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So we we're, we're acknowledging that in order. I mean, we talk about the good without God and how that's a mind fuck for most Christians. They don't understand how you can mm-hmm. be good without God. Well, we're literally on the out on the other end of that, looking back into Christianity and saying. You, you know, you 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 can be good in spite of Christianity, <laughs> and and sometimes when when I see some of these harms of religion, I honestly ask, "How can you be good with God?" Yeah, yeah, that's kind of what I was trying to say. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I do have a number of Christian friends still, and the ones that I've remained close to are the ones that hold their faith loosely, yeah. that use their faith only as a means to to support really the kind of morals and ethics that we have developed secularly yeah. over the centuries and the church has always been kind of behind it on. Um, but they don't use their religion to justify anything. They use their morals to justify the parts of their religion that remain meaningful to them. Yeah, yeah there good you go. point. Good, well said. Yeah. So you're, uh, you got any siblings? Two, two younger sisters. Do they know that you're not a Christian? They don't. Um, one of the reasons I'm not out to my immediate family at this point about my atheism is so fundamentalism, very, very patriarchal culture. Mm-hmm. So my sisters are 
32 and 30. The 32-year-old sister is married, has a kid. I have an adorable two-year-old niece. And (laughs) the 30-year-old has her own business. She has employees. And yet she still lives with my parents and has a curfew. Mm. So fundamentalism is the kind of world in which a woman can be 30 years old, have employees, and also have a curfew. Yeah. If my parents were to decide that they had to cut off contact with me for, you know, they felt morally obligated to, which you've had people on your show sure. have said, yeah, their parents just said, God absolutely needs me to cut you off. Yeah. If they were to tell, especially if my dad were to tell my sisters, I don't know if this would happen, but it's a risk that they weren't allowed to talk to me anymore. There's a chance that they might feel obligated to obey. Mm-hmm. And I'm kind of trying to sort of, in discussions with my sisters, get them towards the place where they would be willing to accept non-Christian ideas, at least to the extent of being willing to disobey. And basically, I want to make sure that my parents can't cut off contact with my sisters yeah. before I'm out to them. Yeah, that's wow. strategic. And, and you, you have a good relationship with them, and you want to keep it. I do, yeah. So your parents are both still alive then? Yes. Mom and dad. Where, where is everybody? Are they in Augusta or around Back you? in California. No, they're, they're back in California. Every, your yeah. sisters live close to your parents. Well, obviously, your, one of them lives with Correct. them. Correct, yeah. Yeah. One of them w- lives with them. One of them now, since she got married, she lives a few hours away. I okay. think about four or five hours away. So we've talked a little bit about your mom and the dancing and now your sisters. What's your relationship with your dad? It's always been kind of distant, not necessarily in a bad way, just in a – like I've, I've never really connected with my family in a lot of ways anyway. Yeah. So, so like my dad and I, we mostly talk about technical things because since I left biology and now I'm in – I'm a software engineer and he's a network engineer and programmer as well. So mm-hmm. we're now in the same technical field and yeah. that's mostly what we end up talking about. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is he more or less religious than your mom? I would say they are both pretty neck and neck. Okay. Um, and they still a- they, attend an IFB? They still attend the same church I grew up in. Oh, wow. Which, mm. listening to my dad try defending, he he does not believe in geocentricity, but listening to him defend why it's justifiable for the pastor to preach this. My dad, when he was an undergrad, he was a physics major. Mm-hmm. Oh, boy. Yeah, like he <laughs> and I, like growing up, like we did science fair projects together all the time and things like that. Like he bought me my first laser when I was eight and you couldn't just go get a laser pointer. And he, he put this together from the laser power supply and tube out of an old supermarket scanner and mm-hmm. like physics to the core. And then hearing him try justifying because you because you have to double down on pastoral authority in yeah. the IFB world or a lot of sort of the project of fundamentalism breaks down. It's kind of, so, you, yeah. don't, you don't question the pastor. Yeah, yeah you, you can't. And you, you have to, even if you disagree with him, you have to justify him being justified in saying what he's saying anyway. Wow. So, oh, hmm. well, let's, yeah. let's talk about your personal life. You, you live alone? I do. You got any pets? Every once in a while, I will, I will keep a, like a fish or a snake for a few years. The last pet I had was a wild caught hognose snake, and I ended up keeping it for just a season because they're a specialist predator on toads. Uh-huh. And this was actually, well, oh, it has been a while since I've had a pet because the, I was still at church then because I would pay the little kids at church a buck each, each to catch toads for me so <laughs> that I could feed them to the snake. Yeah. <laughs> and they have to hibernate. And I knew I couldn't, in my apartment, have a good hibernation space for it. So I let it go early in the fall. Pretty sure it's still there because I used to have a lot of toads around my property. And nope. I don't anymore. Not too many. <laughs> so I'm yeah. sure that snake is still around keeping that toad population in check. Yeah. How about that? So, wow. so yeah, I've, I've always enjoyed pets. Actually, that was one of the reasons I was very ready to leave biomedical research. Um, 
I had started out working mostly cell biology and ended up working on projects that were using whole animal work. It was, it was, um, yeah. Working on diabetic nephropathy, which is the kidney disorder that diabetics often suffer from. Mm -hmm. And so it was very important research and I don't have a moral problem with animal research. I think it's necessary. Um, but animals have always been pets to me and it was really doing a psychic toll on me mm. to to be the one killing a rat every day mm. when I went into work. Um, mm. So that was one of the reasons I was very willing to get <laughs> out of there and do something different. Yeah. Mm. So you're you live in an apartment or a, are you a homeowner? I live in a triplex. I mean, one one unit of this really great old house built in 1917. The, the Augusta area has a lot of these mm. and old Southern homes. Yeah. yeah. It was divided up into units back in the eighties. And so I have a portion of the yard. I have a very nice, um, apartment with a couple of extra rooms. So I have a library and a studio as well, which wow. is very nice. What do you do with the uh, studio? Any and every project. My, my major hobby is collecting hobbies. What? So wait, what? <laughs> my my, my main hobby is collecting hobbies. There is there are very few hobbies that I have not tried. Other people's enthusiasm is very infectious to me. So if a friend of mine is into <laughs> something and they start telling me about it, suddenly I'm buying the books on the topic, buying all the stuff, and getting into their hobby. And then a month later, my attention will have flitted over to something else. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, so like, like, having a studio is nice because it's a place I can put my projects. Yeah, like what though? Like making wine or beer um, making or magic tricks? Don't or? get started because okay, magic tricks, yes. Um, <laughs> beer making, I keep thinking I am going to try either that or making mead, but I haven't actually mm -hmm. yet. Um, so some things that I have gotten into recently because of friends, pottery. Um, weaving spinning yarn um i do calligraphy that was one i picked up on my own woodworking at various times i pick it back up either because it's it's been a hobby of my own or because someone i know is really into it um well you were like a polymath or a renaissance man or something yeah huh? funny wow. you use that word because if if i were to have one goal it would be eventually when i die my wikipedia page in the first sentence to refer to me as a polymath yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. One, of, well, one think... of my favorite poets is named Pete Hein. He's his Wikipedia page starts Pete Hein, comma the Danish Danish polymath. Ah, so you and want you want that polymath in I, there? I, I want that. Yeah. Uh, Jack of all trades, master of none. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. Sure. So that's your studio is used for all these hobbies. You're in your mm -hmm. library. Like, um, what are you reading right now? Oh. Right now, I'm reading uh, – a friend lent me a fantasy trilogy, the Mistborn trilogy, Turtles All the Way Down by John Green that I'm in the middle of. I'm reading a book called Science Without Numbers, which is sort of philosophical defense of nominalism. So do you work from home? I do. I didn't <clears> – <throat> when I first got into this field, my first job, I had a commute. Um which I don't generally miss, but I do miss being able to keep up more on podcasts. Yeah, that's where that I was listen. really. Yeah, so now, um, now I listen to podcasts mostly on my way to dance events. Uh, <laughs> but I've I've worked from home now for about two and a half years, and and yeah, there's I would not replace that flexibility with anything. It is the dream. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Huh? So when you're dancing and and traveling, you ever come up to Nashville? I do actually. In fact, I will be there in February for I think February for an event called Blues Geek, which is a a blues dance instructional and social dancing weekend. Wow, Blues That's Geek. Excellent. Well, I'm writing that down. I may look into that. Now, I I understand swing and and tango and all the other things, mm -hmm. but I don't know what blues dancing is. What is yeah? It? What is that? So so blues dancing, it never sort of penetrated in the wider culture like swing did because. Like so, so swing dancing grew out of African American culture in the 20s through the 40s. Mm -hmm. But since it was performed a lot for white audiences, 
it got into the culture more. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There was a famous issue of Life magazine, which I've actually managed to get a copy of that in the swing community, we just call it the Lindy issue of life um, because they did this huge spread on this new Lindy Hop dance craze. Blues dancing grew out of that same African-American community, but it was, and it was just dancing to blues music. Um, But it was much more just what people did in that community when they were social dancing to blues music within their community. It wasn't something that was really exported to the outside community okay all right and so there's all sexy actually much sexier i bet a lot of it very much is um Mm -hmm. it's not necessarily but because of that and because lindy is so athletic and extroverted and silly a lot of times (laughs) blues definitely in the sort of swing era dance community blues definitely has a reputation Uh, yeah (laughs) So, it's not it's not necessarily sexual, but it can definitely be a lot more sensual than other forms of dance. Yeah, yeah, sure. For some reason, I'm thinking of the movie Color Purple. Mm. And I, in, in in this in Keith's story here, yeah, because you have the religious tension mm-hmm. of, mm-hmm. and then yet you know on that little that little shack on the river, <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> they were dancing in there, you know, yeah. and the and the tension yeah. between the religion and the the art expression. Mm-hmm. And and those little shacks like that, the, the little juke joints, that's where a lot of this blues dancing sure. sort of grew up. And it's interesting because a lot of these other dances kind of had to be reconstructed because they disappeared and then people rediscovered them. And blues mm-hmm. has actually had a continuous history outside of people dancing as a hobby. It's had a continual evolution within the african-american community Mm -hmm. and you can still go there's a very well-known blues instructor who i was privileged to take private lesson with in denver earlier this year named damon stone and he has done a lot of research on this but he also like goes to these little juke joints out in the country Mm -hmm. and people you know just after work, they go down and, and they dance, and it is the direct descendant in just a continuous line of evolution of dancing to blues music every night for decades and decades. Mm-hmm. And what they are doing now is a direct descendant of blues dancing in the 20s and 30s. Yeah. Amazing. Wow. This is amazing because you you do you get in your DNA, you get some of the stuff that was stored in the body. Mm-hmm. I mean, trauma is stored in the body. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. when the body, you know, like you see a baby laying on the ground, can't even walk yet, and you put music on, it starts wiggling. I mean, just <laughs> music does that. So you have the body responding to music. Definitely. and. And in a way that is untainted, untrained, it's unfiltered, this is what my body wants to do. <laughs> and you have these African-American you know, communities where it's just, this is what's coming out, and it is so fresh. It's almost like a wellspring. It's just, you're, mm-hmm. you're tapping into something very primal yeah, and organic, mm-hmm. and it's coming out, and it's coming out of the genes of their forefathers. Mm. I mean, this is this is art at its best to me. I mean, mm-hmm. and human expression and a celebration of what it means to be human. One thing that I hated about the movie Hitch is when uh, the the Will Smith Will Smith character yeah. told the like the heavy set guy that was the, you know mm-hmm. trying to find a girlfriend. He started doing his dance, and Will Smith said, "Never do that again." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you know what was redemptive about that is at the end of the movie, he does get the girl, spoiler alert, and <laughs> and they're at a dance. They're at the wedding reception, I think, and he starts doing his dumb dance, mm-hmm. and Will Smith can eat it, right? Yep. <laughs> because this is just him being him. And I'm talking about, I'm talking about religion here, man, because... And I'm talking about the tension between the movie Footloose and the movie Color Purple, and there's tension between a god who basically is disappointed and and dislikes what it means to be human and is going to suppress that versus yeah. 
the or the, you know the natural natural you know like but not supernatural but just the mm-hmm. the evolutionary process of being scientific accidents we come we are zygotes our cells divide we grow <laughs> limbs and then we get out here and we're walking around we're breathing in and out and we want to fucking dance mm-hmm. and and for for some supernatural celestial fucking dictator to tell me what I can and cannot do with my body <laughs> This is a big yep. deal to me because the great freedom that I feel now as an atheist is I will never, ever apologize again for being human. Mm-hmm. And I, I connect with that really hard. Right? So, I mean, I, you sound like a philosopher. What's, the, what's your philosophy of dance? Do you feel that it is therapeutic to your psyche? Like, what goes on with you? Oh, God, I have talked for hours about dance philosophy, so I will try to give you a <laughs> Give crazy. me a nutshell, yeah. Um, the thing that's important to me in dance is the connection. With, um, with the other person? Mostly, yes. I have started doing more solo dancing, but it's not really where my heart is. Um, so when you say connection, what do you music, mean? So, so mostly connecting to a partner, okay. but also connecting to the music, Yeah, connecting to the – the other dancers on the floor, like, because all the, I don't do ballroom dance. I don't do choreography, all these other types of dance that people do that are not as free form. That's not why I dance. So I don't do those. Yeah. I participate in dance genres that are mostly or entirely improvisational. Yeah. And so even when I'm solo dancing, I'm not just connecting to the music, but I'm seeing what other people are doing and and you're getting energy from them. You're you're creating art with these other people, even if even if you're not necessarily like dancing at them. The one thing that happens a lot at these dance events, if someone's solo dancing, another person might start come up and just start solo dancing near them and you start riffing off each other very obviously and explicitly. And so there's a lot of a lot of connection to other people that are making the same sort of art that you are. So I imagine that after you've gone maybe uh, whatever, a period of time without dancing, you some, you know, something in you is like, I got to get back on the floor. <laughs> it definitely. Yeah. If, if I, if I don't dance, I, but it's, it's not just like, like, so there, there's definitely the, the connection. Cause I was sort of describing the different kinds of connection. But the physical connection is also a huge thing for me. And I tell people unironically, like, I'm here for the cuddles. Like, <laughs> this is this is this is one of the primary reasons I dance is What's the human is need getting for touch? Phys- it is. Um, there's this really great podcast that a friend of mine who's in the psychology field and he works with the psychology of touch. And he's also a blues dance instructor and did this uh, – I'll, I'll send you guys the link to it. Um, but his name's Tim O'Neill, and he did an interview on on his work on the psychology of touch in dance communities and sort of what he thinks it means to him. I have a friend in the dance scene in Colombia who also recently left the same sort of – oh, I didn't mention earlier as part of my tragic backstory. From, from eighth grade through high school, I was homeschooled. Okay. So oh. add that to the mix. So anyway, so she also came out of the same sort of – IFB homeschool environment and we were talking I'm like because I've sort of had this idea of hey there's kind of I, I noticed that a lot of homeschool escapees and a lot of fundamentalist or just very conservative escapees gravitate to the blues dance scene mm-hmm. and a lot of blues dance is done in close embrace which is basically a dance hug and you just you have a nice dance that's just a three or four minute long hug. And a lot of us were so taught to distrust physical touch mm-hmm. that we're making up for lost time. Yeah. And right after she and I had this conversation, I heard Tim's interview on this um, Blues Dance World podcast. And he talked about this. And then I ended up seeing him because I was taking some classes from him at this event in Philly and got to talk to him about it, which was really cool. So just the the physical human connection, you know, we have a very puritanical society anyway, just outside sure. of the Christian bubbles. Oh, yeah. You know, people never believe that you can 
take one physical step with someone without that leading to this cascade. Mm -hmm. Um, Slippery slope. (laughs) Yeah. And so in blues dance, you can have, and just in dance in general, you can have a very sensual romantic experience with someone even on the dance floor. It's not necessarily the default, but it can happen. And, and you can still leave that on the dance floor if you want to. Yeah. Um, we, we have sort of a bit of jargon we call a dance crush, which is someone that you have this kind of romantic connection with on the dance floor, but it always stays on the dance floor and there's never even any question of taking it off the dance floor. Huh. And just sort of a lot of exploring these levels of human connection really opened me up to the idea that we don't have to necessarily take one bit of connection and mm-hmm. then follow it with this entire thing, which – so I haven't gotten to listen to your most recent one yet, be, but I'm really, really interested in, in that because I just read the intro, and I also um, sort of became poly out of my deconversion and right. questioning all of my norms. And then I'm like, well, why am I just accepting this narrative too? And there's the concept of the relationship escalator where yep. once you start doing you, – you start talking to someone – um, with quote marks around it um, here in the South. That's kind of a bit of jargon of not quite dating yet. Yeah. And then you start dating them and then, and, you, and then you get to a point when there's incompatibility and you can't ever scale back. You just have to have a messy breakup. Mm-hmm. And, but, like all, but once you start down this, you have to take the relationship escalator to some point mm-hmm. at which point you, you jump off the escalator. And, and this is just a thing in mostly our American conception of relationships and just a sort of a Western conception of relationships in general. Yeah. This is not even a Christian thing. And dance definitely showed me in a lot of ways how I can take only those connection, the, those pieces of connection that me and another person want to share with each other. Mm-hmm. That's perfectly valid. And we don't have to, we don't have to go any further down that line yeah. Um, yeah, if we right. don't want to. And you can pick things from random places. You can decide to have this sort of connection and that sort without all the things that society tells us go in between or have to go along with those. Yeah. Uh, well, wow. So in your, your dance world, and we've obviously heard the frequency with which you do this and the circles that, you know, you when yeah. you're doing this, I mean, and I can take this out if this is too personal, but in, oh, you have used or have you used these types of dances? Um, sometimes I think what I hear you saying is sometimes you get a room and sometimes you don't. And <laughs> yeah. even then your the way you said, you know, dial it back or, you know, if, if you do get a room with somebody and then there's, you do kind of hit a wall with compatibility and you mm-hmm. see that person at the next little dance gathering, it doesn't have to be, embarrassing or toxic or ugly is just we dialed it back and we're you know so what i mean is that the maturity that you're shooting for it is and you definitely now every relationship transition has difficulties and so there's one of the reasons people just sort of the, the, the relationship escalator is an easy model to follow because you never have to go back and revisit difficult feelings with someone if you don't want to, because society completely supports you in just noping out of a relationship entirely. (laughs) If you had a romantic relationship, there's no expectation really that you maintain any sort of relationship with an ex. Right. Well, we even cut them out of the photos. I mean, like we can, (laughs) you know, we, we can, we can eliminate them out of our lives, but if you're still bumping into these people, you know, that Mm -hmm. kind of forces you to grow up. (laughs) <laughs> so I didn't really start exploring polyamory until earlier this year. So the, my model for dating through most of my time that I've spent in the dance world since 2005 has been sort of a standard American serial monogamy model. Yeah. And so there was a lot of that kind of awkwardness. Mm-hmm. Um, one interesting bit of poly jargon is instead of saying X, people say former. Yeah. Simply because it's it's not freighted with the the connotations of X mm. and it acknowledges that yes, you used to have a more romantic connection with this person than you now do. Um, yeah, and that's wonderful because the X is a way it's a rejection, it's a failure. 
yeah. there's a lot of negative mm-hmm. uh, connotations to that word, whereas former says, hey, you know what? Every human relationship, you know, has a, sel- a yeah. shelf life. Yeah. Like even the- even platonic friendships, sometimes yeah. we go our separate ways, and there's no condemnation for that. There's, I mean, there's no, there shouldn't yeah. be any judgment for that. We're just all evolving, and sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. And the, it, that doesn't mean it's a failure. That doesn't mean I've I've been abandoned. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. in, in a way, abandonment is a baby issue that we all kind of uh, adulthood <laughs> helps you get over. The number one, dec- yeah. I think, the first declaration of of David Rico's thirty two declarations of of healthy adulthood is people can come and go and I'm still okay. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, that sounds basic, but this is what we're mm-hmm. talking about. It's hard. Yeah. yeah. And are, you're familiar with Dan Savage. Oh, yeah. of course. Yeah. Yeah. So Great. one thing that I love that he always talks about, he has this line, he says, relationships are the only thing where we consider getting out of it alive to be failure. <laughs> and he goes on and he says he doesn't consider any relationship a failure unless it ended with people being unloving to each other. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And that's really something I've been connecting with the idea that you can have a healthy relationship transition. I have a now several former partners that we have made varying degrees of difficulty transitions to platonic relationships. Yeah. These are still people that are very dear to me and who, who know me in ways that other people don't and how I can get relationship advice from them that I couldn't get from anyone that I hadn't dated before. Yeah. So, <laughs> okay. So this whole thing points out something to me that I, mm. that I, it, it, it transcends just dating world or even dancing world or whatever. But when I, what I began to discover as a very deeply embedded subcultured Christian, Mm-hmm. Uh, as I got out and I met other people and you get out of the world and you see things, you mm-hmm. read, you know, you just kind of get out of your subculture. Yeah. In a way, like, so for example, the the model in Christianity, especially the more deeper you go, is is courtship. And, you know, you're, they, there's just a lot of stipulations in, in the oh, Christian yeah. world about dating and what you can and cannot do from like, you know, the first time you kiss and caressing or anything. I mean, there's just all kinds of rules, 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 just laden with rules. And as I'm, uh, you know, as I, I've talked to people, I mean, I was, I was just so bubbled in that, that out here in the real world, people are navigating sexual relationships and, and romance in ways, and especially now, I think for some reason, not just because I came out of my subculture, but I think like emerging generations are getting better and better at this. Mm-hmm. And that is, look, you be open and honest. This is the ethicalness of it. Like it's unethical to trick somebody into bed or to yeah. lie to them uh, and to make some kind of I'm I'm totally yours and you're the only one I want when in fact you're juggling several other partners or whatever. That stuff is going to the wayside because people are saying, hey, we're adults, we're consensual, and, and we're upfront about it. Um, yeah. And anyway, it just seems like there's a maturation organically happening in the romantic, you know, American zeitgeist mm-hmm. uh, about, you know, uh, <laughs> honesty and being upfront about it. And I like what I like. This is a mm-hmm. big permission thing post Christian. Is your yeah. you you can like what you like. It's not hurting anybody. It's not breaking any laws. It's not violating anybody's freedoms. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's almost like, especially somebody like myself or anybody that was just immersed in this subculture of you know fear and trembling around your own sexuality <laughs> or whatever. You're like, wow, like this is <laughs> Disney World. I mean, this is <laughs> you're walking into a wonderful environment where if everybody's big boys and girls. <laughs> And everybody's honest and everybody's up front. There's a lot of navigational leeway there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, instead of a train track, you've got more like a bumper car skating rink, you know, where there is no <laughs> tracks. Yeah. You're just going to, yeah. you can go and go where you want. But one great thing about taking those tracks away is it takes away the idea that people then can be obligated to follow those tracks. Mm-hmm. And you have to negotiate with with you know and honestly i'm i'm glad to see one of my former partners says poly skills aren't poly skills they're just relationship skills Mm. 
Mm-hmm. In our general culture, we have these tracks set up that that are kind of the American monogamy norms. Mm-hmm. And you can go online and you can ask people, is it cheating if my boyfriend or girlfriend does X, Y, Z? And a bunch of people are ready to answer with their interpretation of our cultural norms when the correct answer is, well, it depends. What are the parameters you guys have negotiated in your relationship? Right. Yeah. Right. Right. And I think a lot of the assumptions are starting to be challenged in ways that are taking away this this idea that you can just demand things of romantic partners based on cultural norms because they owe you this because they got you this far along the tracks. And so now they have to follow these tracks where they go. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So what you're referring to, I think, is what episode 180, but it's a double episode where the first part is a guy named Mark Russell, and he talks about his book. Second part is Marie LePage. And Marie is a back on episode 108, had an episode. We did 180 mm-hmm. with her as a follow-up. And what's happened in the last year since she did the show with us originally, or two years, is that she's in a poly amorous Mm -hmm. relationship she calls it ethical Mm non-monogamy and (laughs) it's fascinating but the the way it related to the show is when she began to question why do we believe adam and eve were the first two humans you know why Mm -hmm. why should substitutionary atonement be that judicial system that god used to you know Mm -hmm. reconcile himself with the earth or whatever it's that questioning well now that she's like got out of Christianity, she still has that same inquiring mind, <laughs> and she looked. She turned that gaze towards monogamy, mm-hmm. and said, "Why do we do this? And why is this a thing? And and uh, is it a function of our own immaturity and jealousy and controlling, you know, tendencies? Does it, like Christianity, appeal to the darker angels of our nature?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. <sighs> There's this really great web comic um, called Kimchi Cuddles. <laughs> and I highly recommend it. And How do you spell it, kimchi? Like, like the K-I-M-C-H-I. Okay. Like the, it is a mostly autobiographical webcomic that this poly woman uh, writes. And pretty much everything that happens in it is slightly fictionalized from people in her actual circles. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and recently, in a way of challenging, like even if you're going to be monogamous – do it intentionally, do it negotiating with your partner rather than just riding these tracks because they're there. And so she recently actually introduced a character who identifies as an ethical monogamist. Mm -hmm. By analogy with ethical non-monogamy, well, if you want to be an ethical monogamist, you actually have a lot of work to do because you have to be willing to discard all of these these expectations and privileges that society gives you and, and the, these things that you can just hold over your partner mm. and instead have a fully consensual relationship with them. Wow. And See, now we're it, coming all the way full circle, right? Yeah. yeah. But, wow. with, but with ethics and without mm-hmm. patriarchy and without you know, exactly. owner, ownership. You don't own and, another human being. And it's funny that you use that phrasing because – Parallel to this entire journey I've been taking, starting at the end of high school, I started very much identifying not as the Republican I was raised to be, but as a libertarian, eventually anarchist, and now politically I identify as a voluntarist, which is like this minor little niche in the anarchist community. (laughs) Uh, But every bit of my life philosophy has seemed to have been stemming from the idea you can't own people. Mm coming into poly has really felt like just the next step in you can't own people. Yeah. Hmm. I can't just because I'm in a romantic relationship with someone, I can't expect them to cater to me and to, to not be their own person. Yeah. And why would I want to? Because you get so much more, even just from a selfish perspective, you get so much more by relating to people who are whole people on their own than someone that submits to some sort of ownership, mutual ownership requirement that a lot of the toxic sides of these monogamous norms, not that monogamy requires these, but that our social norms 
provide this sort of mutual ownership model that really creates a lot of the negative aspects mm. of sort of normal relationships and, and why the messy breakup is the norm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And people are surprised when you say it was an amicable breakup. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a new thing and it's a it's a mature thing. Uh, you know that movie, A Few Good Men. Who's the guy that says you can't oh, handle the truth? Uh, Jack Nicholson. Yeah, Jack Nicholson. Yeah. This this notion of you can't handle the truth, and here again, mm-hmm. we're talking about this transcends the religious world mm-hmm. in the romantic world, and that is if somebody feels that you are fragile and uh, mm-hmm. that you that this is going to hurt you in ways that the person just literally doesn't want to do. I mean, the reason that. You know, you, Keith, don't want to tell your parents is that, you know, it's going to hurt them and um, they might cut you off from your sisters. And, and mm-hmm. basically, you're, we know that they can't handle the truth. <laughs> yeah. And so we have to tiptoe around this. And so when somebody, you see this all the time, if somebody's in a relationship, they're wanting out and they don't know how to do it without it just being a bloody mess. Mm-hmm. I mean, not literally. I mean, yeah. there is that. Yeah. These are crimes <laughs> of passion, that. though. That's what that is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's, yep. I'm, you know, I'm going to kill you and kill myself because if I can't have you, nobody can. All this mm-hmm. jealousy and possession, that's a, an extension. Mm-hmm. That's where it's going or it can go. But even at, at minimal, it's going to get ugly. And you're saying, I'm going to have an affair so that she will leave me. And I don't have to do, mm. I don't have to be the one that pulls the trigger. I'm going to do this affair that I really don't care that much about, but I know that it'll push her over the edge of hating me, and it'll be actually less painful than me lovingly releasing her. Yeah, wasn't that one of the games and games people play? I don't know what that the is. The idea of ma- of uh, it's an old pop psychology book from like the 70s that oh, yeah. became very popular, sort of describing different kinds of insincere human interactions. Yeah, and <laughs> one of it, and it gave them sort of named games and. This was kind of when game theory was having a bit of a vogue, and so it was all described in terms of that. Um, but yeah, one one of the things described by the psychologist who wrote the book was some sort of behavior where where you get the other person to take the action that you don't want to. Yeah, hmm. yeah. Well, I think what we're what we're experiencing here it's so fascinating to me is that in on the dance floor and especially you even mentioned like if I'm mm-hmm. solo dancing and then someone comes up and solo dances next to me I mean what what's, what's yeah. the difference in now you're dancing with that person but I get yeah. it. Yeah. But but that translates into like how we relate to one another and mm-hmm. Anyway, I don't know. I just think this is a fascinating subject. Um maybe on the way out here for the sake of time uh mm-hmm. Do you have a what we call libation? I guess, or I mean, do you have an opiate that you? <laughs> I love good scotch. Okay, all right. So somebody was telling me about one last night, and I couldn't, I couldn't understand the word they were saying, but it was a smoky. It started with P, like peachy or PC. Peat. 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 P e a t. In some areas of Scotland traditionally peat was used to fire the furnaces that the malted barley was dried in. Uh And in the areas where they traditionally used open ovens for this, open kilns, the smoke would just be over all of the grain and some of it would be absorbed into it. Now, of course, that's not necessary, for, but it's still done traditionally. And so you get that smoke in it. And those are actually... It is. Oh, yeah. those are my favorites. And Isla is the region in Scotland that produces mostly very peaty scotches. Mm. And so, if I were delicious. to go to the liquor store this afternoon, or, yeah, and and <laughs> find a good uh, peat yeah. scotch, um, or if you're willing to spend a hundred bucks, go for Lagavulin. I'm not. <laughs> um, okay. If you are willing to spend fifty bucks, go for Lafroig. Okay, keep going. Um, <laughs> Uh, that, that, so Sorry, this is the thing, it. is scotch is unfortunately not a cheap libation. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, we, we just took a break, and Bob had to go, but uh, we can we can wrap this up. But I, I did think, you know, we, we didn't, we got on to polyamory, we got on to dancing, and all of which are a part <laughs> of your story, and I think they're actually fascinating. But to get back, I don't think that we actually finished your deconstruction story, and so, like, what what were some of the triggers that prompted you to question things? I told you I went to Pensacola Christian College. I had a close friend from there 
who ended up coming out to me as gay. Mm -hmm. I had talked earlier about the fact that like fundamentalism, you know, sort of made me feel morally obligated to be shitty towards certain types of people. And gays were one of those. Yeah. Love the sinner, hate the sin. Yeah, exactly. That bullshit. which at the time, you know, I bought into the idea that that was a legitimate position to hold. Right. I knew this friend, and he was a very sincere, committed, fundamental Christian, fundamentalist Christian. Yeah. So the evangelical way to be gay, not even the fundamentalist way, but the evangelical sort of, if you acknowledge that people can feel these gay urges or whatever, however they want to phrase it, is to treat it as a besetting sin, sort of the biblical jargon for that. Yeah, they that, have to be celibate, right? Yeah, well, if if you can't be in a heterosexual relationship, then you ought to be celibate. These same-sex attraction, which is the other thing they refer to in SSA, same-sex attraction, which is very common in the like gay conversion therapy cults as well. Yeah, you can acknowledge that those happen and just treat them as the same thing as someone who has an urge to steal from stores. It's you know a very demeaning way to look at it. Right, that's something that's very fundamental to someone's identity. Mm-hmm. But also, I knew this friend, and I knew. If that worked, it would have worked for him. Yeah. Because I knew that would have been how, and I found out later, he had been trying to do that since basically he was 13. Yeah. So that sort of first started me smelling the bullshit. Mm -hmm. My form of fundamentalism was very based on deduction from first principles. And if some of those premises, some of those first principles start failing, then very quickly the entire logical structure disappears because I didn't have any particular intellectual commitments to any of these conclusions. I had the intellectual commitments were to the premises, Mm -hmm. like sovereignty of God, biblical authority, etc. So when those premises started falling apart, everything else started falling apart. Did you by chance Uh, witness in your friend like the toll that it was taking on him to suppress his true feelings or his, you know, his... he had moved out of the area for work, and so I hadn't really seen him in person much. So I didn't witness a lot of that mm-hmm. those last few years. Yeah, but Jeff, I, I'm just imagine that it has to take a toll. He's definitely told me about it since. Okay, but he was living across the country from me, so I hadn't actually seen that interacting with him. So that started me questioning a lot of these other fundamentalist things, like. Our version of KJV only, King James Bible, right. was a commitment to the particular text, the New Testament text, the Textus Receptus. That was this nice sort of pseudo-intellectual way of saying, hey, we think this text in the Greek is completely preserved. Mm-hmm. And I started looking into the history of that and the fact that it's just – it's a frankly silly position. Um, there are parts of the Textus Receptus that – no manuscripts of some of these portions of the Bible were even known to be extant at the time. So Erasmus back-translated into Greek from the Catholic a Latin Vulgate mm-hmm. translation, Yeah, which, of course, in our circles, the Vulgate was kind of the big bad because IFB is a very anti-Catholic movement as well. Yeah. So just these things, it's just blindingly obvious that – the Textus Receptus as a text was not preserved in any meaningful sense yeah. that satisfied the doctrine of preservation that we believed. Yeah. But there's a and desire so, to hang your hat on something. I think there's a desire to latch on to something. And so you kind of have a tendency to tell yourself this is reliable. Yeah. When it's not. That was exactly the position I was in. And now I didn't have these reliable things to just lean on. Yeah. I still had a very fundamentally Christian identity. And I kind of expected I'd land somewhere in progressive Christianville. Mm -hmm. I didn't expect to be an atheist. Mm -hmm. I read very widely some really great books, Karen Armstrong's uh, The History of God, very influential for me. In trying to hold on to something that I could consider Christian, I read a lot about there's a book called Inner Christianity, which is kind of a proposal of sort of an esoteric Christianity. 
when I started with my current therapist, she wanted sort of a timeline of my deconstruction. And the way I was able to give her that was I went back to my Amazon purchase history <laughs> and saw when I was reading what books. Yeah, that's a, that's fascinating. And I'm glad you mentioned your therapy because I mean I'm I'm a huge proponent of therapy here on the show and therapy for everyone. Yeah, therapy for everyone. Amen. I actually have a number of friends who did a lot to normalize the idea of therapy to me. It was not something I ever really considered until this year, just because we have so many cultural blocks against it. And of course, my form of fundamentalism was very anti-psychology. Sure, yeah. It was considered a specifically worldly thing. Yeah. Probably because it, it, so much of it associated with Freud, and Freud was you know, anti-Christian, basically. Yeah. Even though you're not going to find any sensible shrinks these days that no, right. are, consider themselves Freudian without a whole lot of adjectives around it. Right, yeah. So yeah, so I was reading a lot of a lot of these books, and at the same time, uh, my girlfriend at the time had started out very sort of nominally Christian, very universalist kind of idea. Didn't start going to church regularly until she started going with me while I was a fundamentalist. Yeah, and our philosophical trajectories crossed at this one point as she was becoming more religious and I was becoming less. <laughs> yeah. And so there was this point at which I really couldn't go to my fundamentalist church anymore. And so we started looking for churches together. We were trying out these very progressive churches. And like we went to this one church, First Christian Church, which was a straight up old school Northeast social gospel late 1800s kind of church, mm -hmm. like the sort of thing that you read about in the history of American Christianity. And it was one of the few places that I heard things like the social gospel movement and specifically Harry Emerson Fosdick, who's a very influential social gospel Baptist preacher in the late 1800s. I believe he eventually became a Unitarian. And he was just basically mentioned in the same breath with the devil in my circles. Yeah. And I heard him just mentioned positively in the sermon, and that was a very interesting experience. Yeah. And then we ended up trying this other church, um, Metropolitan Community Church, which if I were to go to a church in my area, that is probably one of the best churches in terms of being loving and humane. It was funny because it's not even a church made up of people that I would have considered Christian as yeah. a fundamentalist. Yeah. Um, they have a married gay pastor. They routinely get homophobic graffiti sprayed on them that they have to clean off. And we were one of the few straight couples in the church. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. And in a sermon at a place like that, probably the most progressive church in Augusta, the pastor said something. I don't remember exactly what it was. It was some very basic point of Christian doctrine that almost every denomination would agree on like Jesus is God or the virgin birth actually happened or something like that. Yeah. Just very, very basic statement that you wouldn't find many lay Christians who would disagree with. And I had this instantaneous gut reaction. I just thought, wow, that's really dogmatic and fundamentalist of him. Yeah. <laughs> and then I kind of backed out of myself a little bit and I real I kind of realized the irony of me sitting here in this church that I wouldn't have even considered Christian five years before. Yeah. And I was looking from the far right towards that end of the gradient of Christianity. And now suddenly I'm way over here looking the other direction. And I realize from my current perspective, they appear dogmatic and fundamentalist. Yeah. It should go without saying, but when most of all of us, when we deconverted, we didn't set out to deconvert. <laughs> I oh. mean, no, we, we, you know, we just, I, I, I've often said the same pursuit of truth that led me to Christianity led me past it, that we're on this evolutionary personal journey. And, mm -hmm. and along the way, we're obviously happy at, especially yeah. at, at plateaus and at times, and we're not, we're not necessarily looking to ruin our lives. I mean, the, the the metaphor or the comparison with homosexuality, like, why would I choose this? It's a hardship, uh, you know, in this culture to be gay, yeah. and and it's a hardship in this culture, especially in the South, to be 
non-Christian, and no, mm-hmm. nobody would choose this. And so I think what we're hearing and seeing clearly is that you're you're just going about your life and your own cognitive journey, and you're surprised to find yourself in places and going, oh my gosh, five years ago, this is not at all who I was. It, it was very much a surprise to me. And later that day, I was thinking about it a lot, sort of processing a lot. And I realized, sort of looking back at my thought processes, that at that point, I had been an atheist for about six months. <laughs> But I hadn't realized it because I was working so hard yeah. to find a way to have a Christian identity that I could be honest about. Yeah. Well, did you have any panic moments of like, oh my God, I've really fucked up or, you know, wanting to backpedal or anything? I didn't really, but I definitely went through a pretty major identity crisis. Yeah. Because so much of my identity was sort of based around like, I, before, I had thought in explicit terms that I'm not an ex. I am a Christian who X is. Like, whatever things, like, I've always very much identified as a writer. Um, I love to write. It's a way that I process. It's a way I communicate. And I remember directly thinking, I'm not a writer who happens to be a Christian. I'm a Christian who happens to be a writer. Mm-hmm. Like, this was the fundamental basis of my identity. And now, it was just gone. It's like, no, I, I know I'm not this. Yeah. So for probably nine months or so, I, I didn't really know who this Keith person was. Right. I still occasionally think about certain things in terms of past Keith and me now. Past Keith is a, is a separate person that I'm only with a, with a lot of like talking to my therapist and stuff sort of and and remembering things that, oh, are still me. Yeah. That I can really find the continuity with yeah. because it was such a sharp break. Absolutely. And this is going to resonate with the listeners here because this is a big deal. The identity crisis, the the who am I, and going from somebody, I don't know if you would say that you felt like maybe your agency was underdeveloped or some kind of arrested development to your own self and and the, the self is a philosophical conundrum I mean, mm-hmm. we could get into that but we're not <laughs> <laughs> i have and i've definitely thought about that and in fact it kind of it kind of annoyed my therapist when i first started talking about it and how like well you know identity isn't really real and she's <laughs> like so philosophically that might be true but it's not particularly useful exactly as a, as an idea for building up yourself so well, and it, there's she's got to stick to pragmatism, really. I mean, exactly. So, but I would say that I I'm in a place where I kind of differentiate my my mind from myself in that my mind feeds me thoughts without mm-hmm. my permission, and yeah. I have to navigate the thoughts that my brain is sending me, and so that I do kind of differentiate within myself. That's. I don't know. It's not necessarily disassociative or dissociative, but it is. Uh, for example, nocturnally in our dreams, we are unconscious, and yet yeah. our brain is taking us on all kinds of imaginary mm-hmm. conversations and trips and experiences where we're engaging with other humans. And Sam Harris does a thing, in an, and where he's speaking to a group of people, and he says, think of, of three major cities. Ready, go. And everybody kind of thinks of something. And and then his point is, is that if you chose San Francisco and Dallas and Paris, who chose those, you know? (laughs) Yeah. And it's just, it gets to be a little bit weird. Now, so getting back to something you said I want to address, and maybe it could have been the end of that relationship you had with that girlfriend, but as you're going through your own identity crisis of like, who am I? And the Keith from five years ago would never have thought this or said this or done this. And then like, I'm in, I'm in uncharted territories here and I'm not even sure, you know, who I really am or what I really want or how I perceive things and how much can I trust about my own perception of things. If, If that's going on internally, which it is in all of us as we deconvert, if we have a partner that we're in, you know, very intimate with, and they've made this journey with us, or at least alongside us, then they can also feel uh, who is 
for so I'll just speak first person. Like my wife and I, we met when I was we started dating when I was seventeen. She was fifteen. We got married when I was twenty two, and she was twenty. And we're coming up on our thirty year anniversary. And she, you know, married a very, very different cast, <laughs> you know, thirty years yeah. ago. And here we find ourselves. And I can, you know, we're of all the listeners of this show that I hear from on a regular basis. There's a, a lot of them that their marriages are are not going to make it. Uh, yeah. Just because I'm, you know, not only do you, Keith, find yourself in the body of a different person, like that your, your partner, and you know, the people close to us can be like, I don't know who you are anymore, and they, I know, you know, they can distrust the process. Yeah. Like you have swung so far that mm-hmm. just I don't even know like you seem to be convinced right now of something but I don't know who you're going to be in 5 years from now. And it can really throw and, a wrench in the in the relationships. Yeah, and being able to let go of knowing who I'm going to be has been a really big part of this too. Yeah. <laughs> And it, it makes life a, a little more exciting. It does. And that kind of takes me nicely to where my sort of personal philosophy has gotten to. Yeah. Because of sort of the pop cultural connotations of this, it always surprises people when I say that the single most positive philosophical development in my life has been nihilism. Yeah. And of course, that's not the pop culture, nothing matters, suicide cult kind of nihilism no. that you see on like cartoons and stuff, but just the, the acknowledgement that no, there isn't a transcendent source of meaning. Nothing has intrinsic meaning. We are a meaning-making species. Yeah. It's useful for us to create meaning. And now that I'm not just trying to discern what the meaning of things is. And align and, with that. Yeah, and what is right and wrong, but saying, hey – I need to create meaning. I need to create my own ethics. And I feel much more of a drive. I'm always tempted to say obligation because, of course, this drive is, you know, there is no real obligation. Mm -hmm. But we have these evolutionary drives that produce a sense of obligation. So if we just interpret it that way and just say obligation in the way that we have evolved as a social species, I feel that type of obligation to create meaning and to live my life in an ethical way, which yeah. means creating the ethics by which I can live my life. Yep. Well, these drives, I mean, drives is a Nietzschean word. And, mm-hmm. you know, he, he would say that your drives are lying in wait in your person and hungry and thirsty to engage with the world in any given moment. And it is in those ways that you find out who you are because your drives manifest in your behavior and in your action towards others. Mm-hmm. So when as far as this identity crisis and who is the self, it's kind of both and in that nihilism yeah. says uh, there is no extant meaning and I'm going to give it meaning. And you can – it, but either way, I think it's – well, I was going to say it's coming from within, but it is mm-hmm. in some ways a reflection – of how you're showing up in the outside world. I don't know. It's very... Yeah. No, I, I, I would agree with that. And I would say we have these conflicting drives. And I am now choosing to give more space to the empathetic drives, the drives that... Not the drives towards selfishness and mm-hmm. survival as an individual. Mm-hmm but the drives towards making other people happy mm-hmm. towards finding cuz you know you can get your dopamine fix from anywhere we have drives that will give us a dopamine fix from doing some pretty terrible things which is why we've had a lot of violence for a lot of our history as a species but we also have drives that give us nice warm fuzzy dopamine feelings from doing nice things yeah and you can choose now to cultivate those things it's Totally. It, like, like I like how Richard Dawkins explains it, which even when I was a Christian, like you hear so many terrible things about specifically Dawkins and Hitchens. And what struck me even as a Christian when I started listening to them is how driven by compassion they are and how opposite even their reputation in sort of the 
faith positive secular world is yeah. from what I actually saw. Yep. What makes them angry is people hurting people. Absolutely. And we're, we're taping this um, on December 16th. And just as a, a tip of the hat, yesterday was the six year anniversary of Hitch's death. And mm. uh, Hitch, and I couldn't agree more. You put it very well in that I was expecting Hitch to be a monster. And he was so beautifully moral and ethical and loving. Now he he did manifest as an asshole on occasion, oh, yeah. <laughs> but don't but we all? But generally, when people were being assholes. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And and ideally, we take the high road when that yeah. when that happens. But sometimes he didn't. But he's human, mm-hmm. and to err on the side of empathy, uh, you know, this battle with selfishness. In a, obviously, in an indirect way, we are still being selfish by being empathetic because we want that dopamine or whatever, and <laughs> and we find meaning in in, in helping others, and yeah. we ended up we end up benefiting, and that's the irony of it. I think when mm-hmm. I was a Christian, I loved that about parables, and the 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 paradox of how to be a powerful person. In, a, in say for example in like the Trump culture or in the uh, macho alpha male culture, you are powerful when you walk into a room and suck the air out of it and everybody stands in awe of you or you know you're just that that's power in in a in one one paradigm. Then there's this you know Jesus washing the feet. <laughs> yeah. And that actually by coming into a room and caring uh about um uh, how other people are feeling or whatever I I think of it this phrase that to seek first to understand and second to be understood you take mm-hmm. the role of of student rather than teacher you're actually t- that's a position of power. Mhm. <laughs> so anyway, these are these are fascinating things to me. Yeah. And and I love how Dawkins talks about the fact that, yes, we can look and we can say we are naturally driven to certain things, but we have the choice whether we want to transcend nature or simply replicate it. And choosing to transcend nature by selecting which of our drives we give space to. Yeah, exactly. Is, is really for me, that's the project of developing my personal ethics. <laughs> it is, it is, it is, and isn't it great to have a project? It is. <laughs> so I, I know from, you know, I'm a Nietzsche freak, but you know, <laughs> his his inverse morality thing, you know, to where the slave mor- morality versus master morality, and there is a morality that comes out of weakness. Uh, and I, I, you know, I see it all the time, like all these movies that are about vengeance. Mm-hmm. And, um, like you said, with the, the violence that, that we, we feel justified when we have been the victim of something and we get back at, at our enemies. Yeah. And the, th- and that, and that, and, and that can be justified as good. In fact, whole movie theaters, a, a room full of people that see, you know, Mel Gibson, in one of his vengeance movies, come back and just crush his enemies, and there's just an elation in the theater because yeah. it's the, it's all been framed as righteousness, and so all of a sudden this violent act that and that if you just you just saw that one scene, like if you walked in from outside the movie theater and you saw this one scene where he's so and so is crushing another person's head in a vice or something. You would be appalled at the immorality of that, mm-hmm. but because it's been set up and framed as vengeance, yeah, then it's, it's justified. So I, I, I found that I'm the worst version of myself when I'm coming from a place of fear, self pity, resentment, victimhood, or insecurity. So something is said to me, something is done to me. And I'm coming from a place of poor me. It kind of got me back on my heels. I'm backed into a corner. I'm defensive, and I'm going to be my worst self. And yeah. and I do that so often, and especially in the last year, I just found myself behaving very childishly from mm-hmm. the, from these places. And I wanted to change so badly. <laughs> do you have you ever seen the movie Memento? 
No, it's been on my list. Okay, well, it definitely should be on your list because it's it's a it's just a movie all its own, like never been mm-hmm. done before and never since, as far as it's unique. But the 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 premise is that the guy has short term memory loss. You know, he's trying to solve a crime, mm-hmm. and yet he so when he gets a clue, he's going to forget it in five minutes, and he knows that about himself. So he he literally he started with like post it notes and eventually <laughs> tattooed his whole body with these. So his <laughs> so his body is the is the clues that lead to him solving this problem. Anyway, it's a fascinating thing. But it it's it the whole idea behind short term memory loss and tattooing. So I got a tattoo yeah. on my left inner forearm, mm-hmm. and what I had done is that I had made. People, you know, there's a scripture that says we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but with principalities. Yes. I love that because, and I know he's talking about demons or something, but I'm talking mm-hmm. about principles. So that mm-hmm. that that person, whom I'm now deeming my enemy, I've monsterized them, I've demonized them into being the other, mm-hmm. and so all my behavior towards them can be justified. And. Instead of making people my enemies, and especially even my most dearest loved ones, as far as I can, you can turn on your own people if you if you mm-hmm. take up these principles. So my my tattoo says my enemies colon fear pity resentment victimhood and insecurity. Mm-hmm. And any time that I'm tempted to engage with another human being from those platforms, then I I mute myself. <laughs> yeah. Which which is you making a conscious decision to prioritize certain drives because yep. just our neurobiology evolved for very obvious survival reasons. Right. To trigger certain responses when you're on those footings. Like right. those are entirely reasonable. Right. For and survival. Can, yeah, and when you can put yourself in the position of recognizing that you want to promote those drives that that evolved for survival in much more positive social circumstances. That's where choose to get your dopamine hit from empathy because we evolved to get dopamine hits for that too because we survived better in groups than individuals. Yep, yep. It's definitely the better angels of our nature, and that's, yep. what, that's what we're, we're – <laughs> that's our project. Yeah, it's great. I like how you talked about the – the meaning of your tattoo. I've been considering a first tattoo for a while, and one thing I ha- that has been really meaningful to me is, you know, what the mitochondria are in your cells. No. So inside every animal and plant cell, every cell of every multicellular organism, and also a lot of single-celled organisms, every what are called eukaryote. Um, the type of organisms that have a nucleus and other components to the cell rather than just being very simple cells like bacteria, mm-hmm. they have in them these structures called mitochondria. These take oxygen and sugar and produce energy from it. Okay. They started out as parasites. They are unrelated to us. They are related to bacteria. In fact, they are related to bacteria that are also that evolved free living that are still around rocky mountain spotted fever is the cousin very distantly of these structures that are in every one of your cells <laughs> okay over time these mitochondria diminished because once they were living inside your cell as a parasite inside these very early eukaryotic cells as parasites they didn't need to handle as much of the mechanics of being an organism that they used to. Okay. And so when mutations arose that broke some of these mechanisms, it didn't matter because they didn't need them anymore. These were obsolete structures. And so eventually those mutations that didn't matter broke all of this, these structures or exported some of that functionality out into the rest of the cell. So your mitochondria cannot live by themselves like a rickettsia, a Rocky Mountain spotted fever bacterium could. But they are fundamentally related by a continuous series of cell divisions to free living bacteria billions of years ago. Hmm. That was one of the things when I just I saw the evidence for it, the fact that we can take the DNA that's inside your mitochondria, which they have DNA that's not part of you, not part of your nucleus mm-hmm. uh, in your cells. 
And we can sequence that DNA and we can tell exactly how they're related to these other living bacteria today. We know that all mitochondria in all life on Earth are more closely related to each other than they are to their hosts. You have things in you that are more closely related to mitochondria in a plant than they are related to you or any other human. Hmm. And they're an integral part of your cells. This was one of the things that just once I was willing to consider the evidence made evolution just blindingly obvious to me. Hmm. <laughs> wow. And and so a tattoo I've been wanting to get is just a, a very simple sort of schematic, some, you know, sort of symbolic sketch of a mitochondrion. <laughs> Uh, which it's it's a very recognizable structure for anyone who has been in biology. You basically have like an oval with sort of a ruffly oval inside it, and it's just it's this very, very simple, symbolic, obvious structure. Anyone in the sciences would recognize it instantly, and it has so much meaning to me because it is the thing that entirely disproved the whole project of creationism for me. The idea that we carry around in us, we intimately depend on a product of evolution that there is no other explanation for. And you can look at this part of every human and every plant and every fungus, and you can just run the data and you can compare its DNA to the DNA of these living bacteria that are the cousins of your mitochondria. And you can see exactly where they came from. Wow. My gosh. So if you got one of those tattoos, the only people that would, I mean, you would make friends by them seeing that. And, <laughs> and they, they have to be these biological scientists in order to get it. And they would say, hey, you have a mitochondrion tattoo. Like I have a friend in the dance scene. He has several very obscure math tattoos that I yeah. recognize. I'm like, hey are you a mathematician? And he's like, I am actually. I'm like, I noticed your tattoo. <laughs> yeah. That's... <laughs> that but then is... besides just being a geek reference like that, it's very, very meaningful to me personally because it's a thing that caused a major realization for me. Yeah. And I'm, I, I guess it was lost on me because what, what is that personal revelation that it means to you? I mean, I... Just the fact that, that I for so long believed that the creationism was because of what i had been taught that creationism was the best explanation for how life okay. got here yeah 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 i got that i just thought maybe that it mm -hmm. symbolized something more than just an epiphany well it's it's kind of kind of a little bit of that was a major epiphany in my entire deconstruction and so, to me, it's, it is a way of representing the entire journey. Is there a way in which mitochondria represent empathy? Like You could, you could stretch it in a literary fashion. That's, in what, a way, that's what I actually, thought you were doing. Yeah, no, no. This is simply just because it was meaningful to me in my deconversion. Like, this is just a literal scientific realization. Um, but the, but, but that just, the, interestingly, in the history of life... Um, when photosynthetic algae first arose and photosynthesis occurred, they started creating an oxygenated atmosphere, which hadn't happened before. And oxygen was toxic to almost all life that was around at the time. <laughs> and this thing in the history of our planet, this is called the oxygen catastrophe. And mitochondria used oxygen as part of their energy production. And so an early – a hypothesis for why these parasites actually hung on and were not detrimental to their hosts is a cell that had mitochondria parasitizing it had now these mitochondria that were detoxifying oxygen. And so they could live higher up in the ocean where there was more sunlight because there was more oxygen there, but they had these parasites inside them that were detoxing the oxygen. Yeah, and it didn't kill them to go upward. Correct. So, so you could you could stretch that analogy in a literary sense, and you know, and and you could possibly you know analogize that with empathy and with you know the sort of mutual benefit. 
Um, okay, so let's take this to polyamory. If so, what's kept us from going to the surface, if you will, or going to where there's more sun or where there's more frat- fraternization with other human beings is that jealousy no longer mm-hmm. kills us. Uh, competition, yeah. insecurity no longer keeps us from branching out in, in more advanced relationships. And so this, instead of jealousy and, and insecurity being a, a you know, a, a toxin. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've built up an immunity to it. We've matured to the point where we see past it and we're able yeah. to uh, open our horizons a little bit. Now, I'm not saying that all, that people that are, monogamous are shallow or insecure no. or whatever but i'm just saying that there is a way for us to if we can build up an immunity to that which formerly killed us <laughs> yeah which like you were talking about looking at if you're coming from a position say of insecurity or fear then that's going to trigger the the responses yeah. that were beneficial in our past as a species to insecurity and fear. Yeah. And everyone experiences jealousy. Yeah. But when you stop mystifying it and yeah. treating it as this thing that everyone has a right to not feel and it's just another emotion mm-hmm. and it doesn't have to kill the relationship, yeah. you can say, hey, I'm feeling jealousy in the same way that you might f- feel fear or insecurity, but you can interrogate that feeling. Yeah. And you can say, why am I feeling this? Is there a way that we can work together so that I feel more secure that this jealousy isn't triggered and you can treat it like any other emotion that you can process and deal with and not treat it as this magical, terrible emotion yeah. that, that justifies every crazy response. Well, and I think this is why agency comes up on this show so often is because we, as Christians, we had underdeveloped agencies. Mm-hmm. We were not, we were not really, encouraged to trust ourselves, you know, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge yeah. him in all your ways and he'll make you pastorate. So there's this distrust of my own volition. Well, as we come out of that s- spell uh, and brainwashing and we, we, and then we, ha- we find ourselves in this no man's land of like, oh, I have, I have a self or I have a, an agency. And, and then we move into a place where this is cognitive therapy. Mm-hmm. Uh, my brain is, my amygdala is feeding me a, a fear signal, you know, mayday, mayday, danger, danger, the red light is flashing. And before we were, without agency, we were literally just led around like a ring through our nose by those yeah. emotions. Now we've taken the ring out of our nose. We've said, I get to choose, and we can say to our amygdala, thank you. Mm-hmm. I know historically you you would have saved my life in this case, but I actually now know more than you that this scenario is not as dangerous as you think. I hear you. Thank you for warning me. Thank you for the red lights. Uh, however, I'm going to do this anyway, and you're welcome to come along with me. <laughs> and let's let's expand our comfort zone here and and step out of whatever this fear. And, and or jealousy or whatever. I don't know. I just it, it, you know having the agency to hear your own thoughts and feelings, navigate them, choose them wisely. I mean, this is the project, and it really is. And and I think that's part of it. Is like once you get to a point of agency, you really both expect to be given agency in every aspect of your life. You expect everyone to exercise their agency, and you expect yourself to grant everyone agency. Recognizing that agency, it's almost addictive. Just realizing <laughs> – I don't know if you read the webcomic Existential Comics. No. It's, it's this great if, – if, if, you're, if you're a Nietzsche fan, like it's, it's this great philosophy webcomic. Mm-hmm. And one of the characters is Sartre, and he's always doing crazy things and yelling, radical freedom. Okay. And just you know, the idea that philosophically we are we are not fully realizing our potential unless we exercise radical freedom and making decisions only 
out of an, a pure decision to do the thing rather than obligation or? following a set of obligations to yeah. it. Yeah. This is where you go back to your positive nihilism. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. this is, we're free. It's dangerous and scary at first to realize that you can kind of write your own script. But once you get past that fear and, and you're like, oh, I'm not going to die, uh, it gets very exciting. And I think I hear that in your voice. And I'm not sure where you're going with this. Uh, I expect others to exercise their agency. But let me ask you in this context how that works. Yeah. Because you go back into your Christian worlds, especially, mm -hmm. I know you've got progressive Christian friends, but let's say your mom and dad. or, But you can't expect them to have agency. And so... In a way, you enter that world, you kind of just have to yeah. change your whole vernacular. And, and yet I do. And that, that's the thing. Is like it's, it's a continual surprise to me, actually, when people don't now. Like, don't what? So, don't, don't exercise their agency when they, when oh, they just yeah. follow things blindly. Like my dad was defending the geocentricity that that pastor is preaching. Yeah, yeah. And how and do you I do that? Like doing it. it's, it's, it's a completely automatic response based on all of this conditioning. This is the intellectual hoop he now has to jump through to preserve the entire structure. Yeah, and in that Which, moment, though, is he not a zombie? In a way, he is. But this is one of the reasons why, actually, that, that vlog monologue that you begin every episode with is very meaningful. And it's kind of... Listening to that at the beginning, because I've I've heard that video a lot. Like I love John and Hank Green, sure. Um, and but hearing that at the beginning of every episode has been helpful for me realizing that okay, why not be friends with them? Has, <laughs> everyone has built up this structure, yeah, that is incredibly valuable to them. Yeah, and <laughs> and knowing myself and the just the psychological straits that put me in to challenge that structure, I can't reasonably expect everyone to instantly challenge that. Thank you. Thank you. But it always surprises me that they don't. And yeah. that's what I'm mean by expecting others to exercise their agency, not like a placing of an obligation on them, but an expectation in the same way I expect the sun to rise. Like, yeah. why wouldn't they? And then I'm surprised when they don't. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. <laughs> wow. Well, Keith, this has been fantastic. It has. I've really enjoyed this. Well... And um, I don't know, man. What are your What are your plans for the rest of the weekend? You gonna dance tonight? <laughs> I'm actually not. Are you familiar with the the YouTubers Rhett and Link, and uh, the the show Good Mythical Morning? No. Oh, it's this hilarious web show on YouTube. They are touring, and I'm about to. As soon as we get off here, I'm going to get ready and go meet a friend and we have tickets for their show in Atlanta tonight the tour of mythicality wow. and i've written down several things that you prescribed you know <laughs> i've got a lot of I've got a lot of homework according to this show well, <laughs> well hopefully i i always like getting everyone else involved in my obsessions well because you're doing unto others i, I think the golden <laughs> rule shows up all the time because you just said that you adopt all the hobbies of your friends even for a season mm -hmm. and so you you kind of project that onto others as far as they should adopt yours too <laughs> yeah um, uh, that's just human I'm a very evangelistic personality. Fortunately, I'm evangelizing for positive things now instead of negative ones. Yeah, that's true. I, I call myself a dance evangelist sometimes because I really want everyone to dance and know the joy that I get out of it. Well, I, And I can tell you that part of my deconversion and my own personal meaning-making is that I always did... See, I'm a drummer, for one thing. You know, mm -hmm. so I'm just extra, the reason I got into drums is because I can't stand still or not bob my head at every fucking song that comes on i mm -hmm. i completely get tractor beamed by rhythms oh yes and as a young child i had a lot of liberty before i got you know brainwashed into self-consciousness i mm -hmm. i would dance in ways that was just freestyle yeah and now i am racked with and I know people that listen to this show say, man, you don't give a rat's ass what anybody thinks. But that's not true when I'm dancing. Yeah. I'm very self-conscious of what I look like when I'm dancing. And I am on a mission to break out of that straitjacket. 
Okay, are you in Nashville as well, or is that just where Bob is? No, we're we're both in Murfreesboro, which is a suburb, you know. Okay, um, look up Nashville Blues Dance on Facebook. It's a great community, a lot of awesome people. Yeah. If you want to break out of that, go check them out. I have a lot of friends there. You tell some of the people that you know Keith Beckman from Augusta, and they'll know who you're talking about. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that because I've my my pursuit I started taking private le- not private lessons, group lessons mm-hmm. of all kinds of things. Um you know, ballroom stuff mostly. Yeah. And steps and stuff and um and and it's kind of stalled. Like that whole pursuit has stalled mm-hmm. and I think I'm going to revive it by by visiting this yeah. blues dance Nashville. Well, and and every dance scene has a lot of have different values that connect to different personalities. The reason I don't connect with ballroom is the relative dependence on on shared vocabulary on on knowing a set of moves yeah. and your partner knowing that same set of moves. And like I said, what I really get out of dancing is the improvisation. Yeah. And that's why I gravitate to the, the dance communities I do. So if you've stalled in the ballroom community, yeah. that might not be the dance that's meshing with your personality. That makes total sense to me because when I was a drummer, I was a jazz drummer. And oh. I, I, I improv, even now, like in a comedy sense, uh, be, you know, the tagline from my show is "Be a yes sayer to what is." Well, that's that's improv. <laughs> that is yes and. Um, and if you were a jazz drummer, okay. So I just recently taught a private lesson, and I had to explain the concept of the pocket to someone, <laughs> to to my student, because the concept of rhythm in European based music theory is very different from in jazz and blues music theory. Yeah, right. You've got that. That's like. That is ninety percent of understanding the rhythm that's necessary in the dances that I love is just knowing the pocket, yeah. knowing how you can play with that and stretch it one direction or the other. And well, this sounds exciting. I'm, yeah, I'm excited. I can't wait to visit this place. Great communities. Find something that and they're okay and, with and, novices like me showing up. Oh yeah, and also because it's a social dance, you don't even have to bring a partner. Like everyone dances with everyone. Yeah. Um. So novices show up they have beginner classes they have intermediate classes they will take you from walking off the street never having danced before even yeah all the way up to if you're into it like traveling around and competing i don't compete it's not my thing i have a lot of friends who do yeah and there's there's so many ways you can go from it but yeah you can show up off the street never having danced before period yeah and they will teach well you may have just changed my life i don't know that sounds (laughs) exciting my life yeah So uh, lastly, on the way out, what's what's the story behind you? You have a large, I say large, you have you have a full beard, you have a huge mustache. <laughs> what's the story there? It started out as laziness. I used to grow it out in the winter and then shave it off in the spring because this is the South and it's very hot. And I just assumed that a beard in the summer in the South would be miserable. Yeah. I grew up in Southern California. We don't have weather there. We get to whine about the heat when it's 80, the cold when it drops to 60. And no joke, people down here in the South actually think I'm joking when I say this, but this is true that the weather announcers, if it's 85 for like three days in a row, they will start calling it a heat wave and they will warn old people to stay inside to avoid heat stroke. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> then one spring it just got later and later and suddenly it was like June and I hadn't shaved off my beard and I realized that far from being a pain, it was actually like... You know how sweaty you get when you're just like slick face sweat and the beard protects you from all that. And it's actually much more comfortable in the summer here in the South than I expected it would be. So it's been like about five years. It would be back at this point in maybe like eight months if I shaved it off and the mustache would maybe take a year. Yeah. Well, Keith, man, you're fascinating. You certainly are a geek, and you geeked me out a few times. <laughs> you lost me on some of the mitochondria, but it, it's fascinating, and uh, man, I wish you the best. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. I really enjoyed this. 